Hey everybody, it's Sean Gibbons from the Communications Network. Welcome to the first special learning session we've had together at Com Network V+. Uh, everyone's coming into the room now, so I'm going to yak at you for just a quick minute, tell you a couple things you can expect coming up uh, in addition to today's presentation uh, from our friends at Mott and uh, Carmel Lewis coming in from Flint, Michigan. Uh, you may notice our friend Marv is back with us. She's uh, somewhere here probably on your screen, but if you need ASL interpretation services, you can find them there. We've also added some closed captioning services, so if you want that, chances are down below at the bottom of your screen. I'm presuming I'm sitting at the top of your screen, down below at the bottom of your screen, you'll see something that says closed captioning. Go ahead and crack that open. You're welcome to follow along there. But while we're coming into the room, and folks still are, let's go ahead and go into the chat. You know what I'm about to ask you to do, because this is the drill now for us pretty much across the board. Enter into the chat, and if you would, make sure you're talking to all panelists and attendees, or maybe it says everyone, right? Type in your name, where you're coming in from, so where's home right now, and then this idea that we borrowed from Professor Brene Brown down at the University of Houston, and that's the two-word check-in. So if you just in two words, how are you doing? And let's be in conversation with one another as we get together. My colleague Tristan Mahabir, as he often does, is running the slide deck for us, and so Tristan, if you would, go ahead and uh, just hop into the screen, go to the next slide. Uh, one thing we want to make sure you all are aware of is everything that we've created together over the last, now I guess over a month, you're coming up on a month, between V and V Plus is now up available online and you can see how to get into all that stuff right there on the slide. And of course, we've been sending you a lot of emails. If you have any questions, just shoot us an email. Happy to help you, but you can find all that information in the app uh, and elsewhere in your inbox. Uh, but everything you want to watch, whether that's that Stacey Abrams conversation with Nicole Hannah-Jones at the 16 Night Point Project that happened during V, that's up on comnetworkvirtual.org. You can also find there's a special page set aside for all the stuff that we're creating together. So most recently, that was that conversation with Mia Birdsong and a little bit earlier on uh, with Charles Vogel, the author of uh, The Art of Community. And let me tell you a little bit before we get started here, what we've got coming up uh, in the next couple of weeks. So Tristan, if you would, next week, we hope you're gonna be able to make some time to join us. We're incredibly excited about this. Evan actually participated in V, he was a panelist in a session there, but he's gonna be in conversation with uh, the network's former board chair, Jesse Salazar. Evan, I hope is known to many of you. He was the creator and founder and the, and the man who ran the organization Freedom to Marry which did a really extraordinary thing and turned to a lot of communications research and science to drive the messaging around marriage quality and of course ultimately broke through with marriage becoming law of the land in 2015 after an 0 for 32 experience at the ballot box before what was it maine maryland minnesota and washington state finally broke through in 2012 if i'm remembering correctly all right so let's go ahead and jump ahead to the next one evan will be with us that's going to be a fantastic conversation behind that story of how marriage equality happened and then just before halloween if y'all are doing trick-or-treating or whatever that looks like where you're at we're open to ideas around here uh dr clarence b jones who's a name that's familiar with you his 90th birthday is coming up just in January, but he's going to be with us just about a week prior, a couple days prior to the election, to reflect on all that we've all been going through together over the course of this year, talking about the racial reckoning around this country and, and what's at stake in front of us as we head towards the elections and some of his experiences from the civil rights movement. He's going to be interviewed by our friend uh, Jennifer Oldham from the Healing Trust down in Nashville. We couldn't be more thrilled that Jenny's willing to do that, but that'll be a great conversation. So those are things that are coming up. But right now, just before us, I want to make sure that we make time for our friends, Karma, Sarah, and Amy. I'm going to get out of the way. Sarah's going to take it from here. You're in very good hands. Again, if you need ASL interpretation services, Marva's here, so take a look for her in your screen. And then there's co uh, closed, closed captioning available through the through the closed captioning uh, panel that's also down at the bottom of your screen. We will take questions towards the end, if you would. Just remember, we're putting those in the Q&A box, and I'll scold you all to do that a little bit later on. But uh, look forward to this great conversation, a lot to learn from these folks. And it all begins, as all communication does, with listening. So Sarah, with that, I'm going to start listening. Take it away, if you would. Yes, thank you, Sean. We are excited to be here. And um, my name is Sarah Shook. I'm a communications officer over at the Charles Stewart Mott Foundation, joined today with Amy Hovey, who is on our Flint program team at the Mott Foundation, and Karma Lewis, who is a Flint resident and also the president of Flint Neighborhoods United. So I'm very excited that she can join us here today. Um, we have a lot, of, a lot of good things to share. So um, please feel free to ask questions at the end. We're really excited about the question portion because I know we're gonna be going through quite a bit of information. But um, so this Focus on Flint project initiative honestly started about two years ago, you know, maybe even a little bit for 
before in this thought process, but um, it, it really showcases a great partnership between our communications team and our program team. Um, and what we're hoping to share with you today is just kind of a little bit more about how this community engagement initiative really helped us connect with Flint residents, connect with the Flint community, um, and just kind of see what was so important to them to help us do our job better. So um, hopefully we can share some wisdom and uh, talk through this together. Good afternoon. So happy to be here to talk about our Focus on Flint um, project. Um, so why Focus on Flint? Well, you know, it really comes down to us trying to do a better job at doing our job. Um, our overall goal is to increase the quality of life for Flint residents. And in order to do that job well, we felt like it was important for us to create a deeper relationship with the Flint community, with the residents that live here in Flint. Um, we really wanted to create a more intimate relationship with them so we would hear their stories firsthand. What did they think are the top priorities? How could we actually increase their quality of life? And what were their thoughts on, on how to funnel that money to different projects to make that happen? We also really wanted to take the time to have them understand us a little bit better as well. Understand what the Mott Foundation is all about, how we fund programs and projects, why we do what we do, and, and be able to kind of create relationships so we could work together moving forward to make Flint a better place to live. And it, it wasn't a short process. We definitely didn't just um, throw some things together. So this has, has been going on for a while, but we knew every step of this process, it was so important to hear from Flint residents. Um, they were literally a part of every single step of the way. So it started with our focus on Flint publication. Um, we had 900 residents participate in a quality of life survey. You know, you probably have heard of Flint, Michigan. A lot of people have heard about Flint, Michigan because of the water crisis, but we really wanted to hear from residents. We wanted residents to be able to tell their own story about um, what life was like in their city, in their neighborhoods, in their communities, um, and, instead of other people telling their story. So it started with that survey that we could hear from them and the survey along with some local, state, and national data, um, we created this publication to try to take a bigger look, uh, a fuller picture of what life was like in Flint, Michigan versus you know, bits and pieces. And even when we were looking for that information, we realized there was no one spot to find the information. And then we mailed the publication to every mailing address in the city of Flint. So residents, businesses, we really wanted them to see it, you know, and and to share back with us. Does this actually sound like your experience? Does this make sense? Um, is this a good resource for you? But then we were able to take that publication and use it as a springboard for conversation. And so where there was so much work on the publication, it didn't become our focus at these, um, at these meetings with residents. It was just kind of, hey, let's start talking about this, but that's, now let's talk about your priorities and your concerns. Are they the same as you know, the 900 residents that participated in this survey? Um, and it was important. We, we asked simple questions. What are your priorities? What are your concerns? What are you seeing in your, your neighborhoods and, and your whole city that you really think needs to be focused on? And so as we're going through this process, past the community conversations, we didn't actually have a plan until we got through them. We wanted to really let the residents guide the process because if we had in our mind how we thought it needed to end, I think that would have um, hindered us from truly listening to the residents. And so when we did, we heard some of their top priorities. Their number one priority was neighborhoods. And you know whether that was blight or safety or beautification, they wanted to make some changes that directly impacted where they lived. And so we took it from there, We're like, okay, the next step was share your, share your ideas. What projects, what initiatives, what would you actually like to see um, happen in your neighborhoods to, to help strengthen them? And then we're like, okay, now we have all these ideas, now what? So we let them vote. We said, here's, here's some grant dollars that we wanna put directly into your neighborhoods and we're gonna let you vote on it. 
Um, and it, it was it was a process and we learned a lot through it. We've never done something like this before and we didn't actually know how it was going to end until we got there, um, which was actually kind of one of the fun parts about community engagement. And it, it showed that we were truly listening to them because it's it's their community and we shouldn't be making any decisions about Flint without hearing from the residents first. And so we, I just talked a little bit about these community conversations and they, they were the biggest part of this process by far. And obviously we, we still want to continue them, but uh, we did 30 in about roughly three months time. We seen September of last year and November of last year, we held three commun 30 community conversations. Um, and it was a progression. We started small. Uh, we met with smaller intimate groups of eight to 12 residents so we could really um, hear from them without residents and people talking over each other and not feeling like they were heard. Um, and it was really community led. We maybe asked a question or two and then just kind of let them go. But from there, we went to some larger communi uh, community conversations where it was kind of an open invite to Flint businesses, business owners and residents to really just hear from them. And those probably ranged from 30 to 50 uh, participants. But then we ended in a really large um, community forum to kind of bring everything together, show what we learned and then take the next steps. You know, But even, like I said, the next steps always included feedback from them. It wasn't just us giving a presentation, it was continued feedback. Um, and you'll notice here that we had about f just over 400 participants, which to us, it seemed like we were meeting with a lot of residents, but 400 in the grand scheme of Flint's whole population is not a lot. So we know there's a gap that we know we miss people. We know there's still residents we need to try to reach out to, but um, it was just our starting point. Um, and we got surveys filled out at every point of the way. So not only are we talking to them, we're taking notes, we're listening to them, but then we also have records of here are my priorities, here are what I wanna do because it's listening, but it's also collecting that data for us to use going forward. So going back to the beginning of doing these more intimate community conversations, it had really been a while since the foundation had participated in doing this in depth of uh, community engagement. So we knew we needed to take a step back and actually prepare. We, we wanted to include everyone on our team, have everyone involved, and they had, we had a different amount of experience levels on our team with the engagement. Some people who had done a lot of community engagement and others who were pretty new to it. Um, so we started with bringing in a group of women who included Karma, so we'll hear from her in a second, um, and who really do a lot of community engagement in Flint. They understand the neighborhoods, they understand the venues, they understand the other groups and how they interact with one another to help give us guidance on how we approach our more intimate conversations to make sure that we didn't accidentally step on landmines that we didn't know existed because we aren't out there every day knowing you don't want to put this person and this person in the same room together or you won't have a conversation. So they really kind of reviewed what we were thinking and helped us tweak it so that we would be able to do it better. Um, one of the things they suggested, which was really just super helpful to us, was actually bringing in a consultant to give us training on how to facilitate these small group sessions. And it was really, a little bit less about facilitation and a little bit more on how to really listen, how to meet people where they are in situations where they feel comfortable sharing their story, um, going to them rather than having them come to us. Um, also digging a little bit into implicit bias, helping us understand what implicit bias was, what we were taking into the room with our own implicit biases, and how we could um, remove that barrier and really open our ears and listen to what people were saying to us without trying to jump ahead of them. Um, so we really took time to make sure that we were prepared for what we were getting ourselves into um, and making sure that we had a process that was going to give us the results that we wanted to have. And, you know, Carmen, I think it would be helpful for the audience to hear from you as somebody who was a part of 
of that group that gave us guidance on your thoughts when we called you. How did you feel about being asked for advice as well as some of the advice you gave us? I was actually excited and I knew about all the work that residents had already been doing. So this was their opportunity to share that information that they needed for you to know. And the way I prepared for that is I actually contacted uh, quite a few people after I had given you guys that neighborhood leaders list. And I let them know, hey, my foundation is going to be contacting you because I knew that in the community, people don't expect to hear from anyone related to the My Foundation. So I wanted to let them know that you are going to get that call and it's no joke. <laughs> and so that way they would be ready, basically, for when you called. And I do believe it worked. Yeah, thank you. It was such a big help. In and part of the, the preparation and getting ready was really talking about how we could reach as many people as possible. Karma mentioned the neighborhood uh, leaders list that she gave us. And it was really important for us to be intentional about hearing from as many residents as possible, but also making sure um, it was a very diverse group that we were reaching. And so we knew we had people we heard from on a regular basis and we knew we had our contacts in the community, but we really wanted to hear from voices that we hadn't heard before. And so we reached out to these neighborhood leaders that Karma and, and the other, um, other people of the group kind of helped us out with. And we asked them to, to come alongside us and be co-hosts to these smaller groups. And when they were co-hosts, we, we gave them the responsibility of inviting residents to join us. So uh, we, didn't, we didn't have any hand in choosing who would show up to those meetings. It was, um, it was really their decision and, and that was great. I mean, we got a lot of voices we hadn't heard before. We got some critics, you know, but even that was important to us to hear and um, to hear how they felt about us, how their community, it, it was really important. Um, and reaching out to them and getting that diverse group, some of it was on us as well. So it wasn't just having these in-person meetings. We have a, um, a lot of input areas online. Um, we had our website that we created. We had a designated phone number and email um, in case residents were more um, comfortable with that. Um, we also, most of our information, whether it be flyers or our update page or our emails that we sent out, were also translated into Spanish. Um, so we could reach that community as well. And every time we had a, a small group or a larger group meeting, um, we also made sure no one needed um, any other translation services. So when we say we wanted to reach as many residents as possible and a diverse a group as possible, we also had to make sure we had material uh, ready for, for all those different groups. Um, Karma, can you just talk a little bit about why it was so important to, to bring in those community leaders and to, to really invite in that diverse group of residents? Uh, because it was, that was important because they were the ones that were actually out there doing the work in order to attempt to improve the quality of life in the neighborhoods. And <clears throat> By going into their areas, their spaces, because I did receive some phone calls. Karma, are you going to come? We're going to meet here at this particular park. By doing that, that allowed them to be themselves, their authentic selves, because they are in their own spaces sharing what they have with you. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Thank you, Karma. Um, and so you see this, this information here, and it just gives a little bit of snapshot of the type of residents or the, you know, the demographic that we spoke with. Obviously, you see a, a high demographic with our older residents, um, and it really just does show how active they are in their community. You know, sometimes we took over a, a community meeting that was already happening, and they're retired. They're very committed, um, but it does show that, you know, moving forward, we, we need to make a little bit more effort and reach out a little bit more for some of those specific age groups. Um, but we are happy to see that there was at least a mix. But when you do have your co-host inviting for you, you don't exactly know who you're going to get to show up. So, but that is something moving forward that we'll try to fill in those, those gaps as well. 
uh, Flint has nine wards and people do identify themselves by the community they live in or the ward that they live in. And so we just wanted to make sure when we were reaching out to those leaders and reaching out to different um, areas of the city that we were trying to touch on all. Again, you'll see, you'll see a gap. Um, you know, there are two wards that are only 2% and 4%. And so um, obviously this being our first time doing something like this, we're gonna work on that a little as well to make sure we are um, trying to equally reach out to some of those areas in the city. Talk less, listen more. Um, and we had to, as Sarah mentioned earlier, we had to determine more ways to listen, right? So we had the small conversations. Um, we also had surveys that we made available online with the website that was mentioned as well. Um, and making sure that we also had surveys available where people were, right? So people are at the library, people are at our community centers, people are at the farmer's market, uh, or at city hall. So again, trying to get to them where they already are rather than counting on them to go out of their way to come to us. So we really, really tried to make sure that we had surveys at a lot of those places. Um, also was mentioned, you know, having a, a phone line available, I think was important for people who prefer to communicate via the phone rather than the internet or having to fill out a, a survey. Also helps to address if there's any literacy issues um, to really um, have a lot of avenues away uh, available for people to be able to provide some some input to us. Um, you know, we did this, this slide mentions, you know, did we shy away from critiques? And of course we didn't, um, we were prepared for them. Um, you know, it's important to us um, that we hear them and that we listen to them and are able to make some adjustments in what we do um, again, so that we can just basically do our job better. So we just really tried to make ourselves available so people could speak to us in any way that they felt most comfortable doing. Here's a couple things that residents um, specifically um, said to us in the comment areas of the surveys. And what it really came down to is, you know, overall people were very thankful for the opportunity to give us some input to have the conversations, to create the relationships, which, you know, they feel comfortable now emailing us or calling us and, and we feel comfortable reaching out to them to see how things are going in the neighborhoods. Um, people were also anxious to know that the conversations were going to lead to something. Um, were we going to listen to what they had to say and actually invest in fixing some of those issues that they mentioned? That was also uh, came through very clear, not only in, in the surveys, but also in the in the discussions that we had, the more intimate discussions. Um, Karma, I think the the audience would love to hear what you heard from the community that maybe they didn't sh share with us directly, but things that, you know, kind of behind the scenes people were sharing with you. <clears throat> Yes, um, they were honored that, well, I'll use their words. <clears throat> the people in the ivory tower decided to come down to their neighborhoods and talk to us. And they were really tickled about that. And it made people happy that we're finally appearing to come together. People are, our residents are accustomed to uh, my foundation funding services through other organizations and never really communicating with the residents. And so this was very different. And to top it off, Ridgeway White decided to do a Facebook Live mm -hmm. on a cold day, which looked like a very, very cold day for him. Saw his breath and everything as he spoke. But he did a Facebook Live announcing that there would be a $1 million grant for Flint and we get to decide how to spend it. And he did that at a very difficult personal time in his life. And people saw that. It was being shared around social media and people saw that as him becoming more human in their eyes. 
and nothing you guys could have done could top that. Thank you, Karma. Uh, and that was uh, transitioned well. And so Ridgeway White, for those who don't know, is our president and CEO. And I'm going to actually show you the video that he put on Facebook. Um, but it, it does kind of showcase the importance of having leadership involved. And he wasn't just involved, he was excited about it. Um, and we didn't actually re fully realize, you know, how much the, the residents and the community appreciated that until we had some of these conversations with Karma. But as, as a little bit of a background, it was just shortly after um, his father and longtime Mott Foundation leader passed away. So you'll get a little bit of hints of that during, during the video. Hey everybody, uh, Ridgeway White here, uh, coming to you today uh, from downtown Flint in front of the Flint sign. It's a beautiful Friday morning, sunny in Flint, 25 degrees, a bit cold. Uh, I can see my breath. Um, reason I'm coming to you today is I'm just feeling grateful for the sun, for all of the outpouring of support for my father uh, and my family. It's been a tough couple of weeks and I uh, wanted to talk about uh, things that I'm grateful for. Uh, first off, uh, grateful for an event I attended last night, Art of Achievement Awards, put on by the Chamber. They did an amazing job recommending, recognizing people that are working every day to help improve Flint, to make Flint a great place to live, work, uh, and enjoy. Also went to the Second City uh, show at the Capitol. Uh, a lot of great comedians there. Um, need to get some more people out to the shows, but uh, definitely um, great things occurring there. I wanted to talk to you a bit about Focus on Flint. It's been a while since I, I talked to you about what's going on. We met with, uh, uh, had, had over 30 community engagement sessions, uh, met with a lot of great people sharing ideas. You know, here's what we've heard. We've heard that people, number one, are, uh, are concerned about blight uh, in the neighborhoods. Two, safety. Three, economic development. And four, education. So those are the top four priorities. Uh, this... <clears throat> This uh, tomorrow, on Saturday, uh, November, uh, what is that, November 9th, uh, we've got our final sort of report out to the community, and, uh, and that's what you're going to hear. Uh, but, uh, you know, in honor of my father and things that are going on, you know, I wanted to create a little chaos today. And uh, so what, I, what I'm going to talk about is, um, you know, how we can make this thing really come alive. And, uh, you know, if, if you're like me, you've attended a lot of community engagement sessions and things like that, and you say, well, what's coming of it? And so, so here's, here's my thought. Here's my thought. In honor of creating chaos and honor my father, um, you know, we're going to roll out a million dollars in community-driven grant making. And because the number one priority was uh, neighborhoods and removing blight, creating safety, creating a great environment, improving neighborhoods, um, we want to hear your ideas. So go to focusonflint.org. Uh, and uh, tell us your ideas. Tell us how we can deploy a million dollars. And you guys are going to vote on this, do everything. Uh, starting tomorrow, running into 2020, we're going to narrow down ideas, help work, and, and just listen to the community on how we deploy a million dollars in the neighborhoods of Flint. So I'm excited to do this. I'm gonna, my staff's going to freak out when they see this message on, uh, on Facebook. But you know what? Uh, uh, it's one of those weeks and, and we got to do stuff like this. So um, we've heard you. Neighborhoods are important. And uh, come, come on, come on, come tomorrow, November 9th. But also go to focus on Flint.org and tell us how to how to improve Flint's neighborhoods. Thanks so much. Bye bye. So obviously it's, it's not the highest quality video, uh, but it didn't matter. We didn't know he was going to record it um, ahead of time, but it was perfect. And it, it really just shows that he was invested in it. And, and I, I think it also shows the importance of being authentic. I mean, he, he shared parts of his life that was happening, but he also shared why he wanted to do that. And I, I think that was a, a pretty big thing to include in this process. So he announced it, right? So we were gonna start having people submit ideas for what they would like to see happen in their neighborhood. Uh, and once again, we didn't fully know what this would look like, but we started collecting ideas at that forum. Um, we had it set up online. We had different um, options around the city for people to submit those ideas. Obviously, this was uh, pre-COVID when, you know, things were open and community centers were open. Uh, but overall, we had 440 people submit 625 ideas. 
which is a lot of ideas. <laughs> so we're like, great, what do we do now with all these ideas? Um, we were able to, to take that list of, of what residents gave us and um, create a list of 70 potential projects from what they gave us. Uh, we took out projects that we just couldn't fund. For example, someone suggested that we decrease uh, mortgage interest rates, right? Not something the foundation uh, can do. So <laughs> we took some of those out and there were a lot of similar ideas that we were able to combine. Um, we kept the ideas that were very specific, maybe um, on a certain building or a certain part of the community, but we were able to come up with a list of 70. And we're like, okay, this seems good. Hopefully residents don't make it, they don't seem overwhelmed. Uh, we didn't really know how this would go. Um, but we created this list, we allowed them to vote, they could give up to 10 projects, and then they actually got to distribute the $1 million, right? So they got to play around and adjust how much they gave to each project until they hit a million. They had to hit a million, and they couldn't go over a million. So it was kind of a, a game, and it helped them, I think, understand how far 1 million would go. Um, and I think the really important part about this voting process is we said we would I have seven plus here because we were able to fully fund seven ideas and then a portion of the eighth until we eat until we hit one million dollars. So when we got our top ideas, we took the average amount of how much people gave for that project. And we could have been like, okay, let's round up or this would work for this, but we didn't. Instead, we took exactly what the residents told us and we said, here's what we're funding until we hit one million dollars. So that fully funded seven plus a little bit of the eighth. And I think the important part about that is it really showed Flint residents that their voice and their vote mattered. We didn't tamper with it. We didn't mess with it. Um, we just kind of said, this is what you voted. And you know, here it is. We still have uh, a version of the voting platform up and I'm gonna show you a quick video that just kind of showcases it a little bit, but you'll also see the URL. Um, so you'll be able to, to go and check it out with the password if you just want to play around with it. It's the exact version. It's just hidden now. So it's, it's not public, but you'll see they could pick their ideas, move the, the amount, the cursor, how they saw fit. They could only give up to 250 per project. Um, some projects started at five. Some projects started a little bit more than that. Um, for example, to take down a, a house, you need at least 15,000. But um, Karma is a resident. Do you think people had fun with this? Do you think it was a lot? You know, we weren't sure if it would be overwhelming or not. Uh, people were surprised. They had fun with it. Um, I had a couple of people say that they went, took a look at it, had to stop and go back at another time in order to focus on it a lot better. So people appreciated that their input went so far. No, that's great. and. and like I said, this is the first time we didn't know exactly. And you know, if we do it again, it, it might look different, but uh, we just thought it was important to, for people to say how they wanted the money to be distributed. Um, and something else cool about that is, you know, we say we funded seven plus projects, but there are many projects on the list that didn't make those top that we're still looking into. So it's not like we disregarded some of those because they didn't, they didn't make the cut. So there are still a lot of projects that residents said they were important to that we're looking into. We learned a lot. Uh, you know, we went in really just trying to get more information, create the relationships so that we could do better at what we're trying to do. And I think we are doing better because of taking the time in and listening and um, reacting to what we heard. As Sarah said, you know, we, we couldn't fund every single idea that came in through that million dollar um, granting process, but we're certainly taking that into consideration, some of those ideas as we plan for, for our giving this year. Um, there were a few grants that immediately, based on hearing um, the suggestion that we were able to, to award, um, you know, people love to be heard. I mean, Sarah, I mean, what are your thoughts? Like, what are some of the things that you thought we learned? People, people, liked the opportunity, I think. No, I think you're right. And I don't know why I should be surprised by this, but I was pleasantly surprised that people didn't hold back. Like they told us exactly what they, what they felt. And I don't think we were surprised by what they told us, but it was refreshing that they could open up to us. Cause you know, they shared their frustrations, 
And sometimes it may have seemed like they were, their frustrations were toward us, but they weren't. They were just happy that people were listening. And there were a lot of other organizations in the community, other foundations that were also doing these sort of community conversations. So we for sure were not the first. We may have been, you know, one of the last to do these, but they, they still appreciated being heard. Um, but then they made it very clear that they wanted something to happen next. So that was always in the back of the, our minds that, you know, something had to be done by the end of this. Right, which I think kind of take a, takes us to the, to the next slide of challenges, right? If you're going to have these conversations um, with, with folks in, in the ways that we did and really do this comprehensive and out, of an outreach and we want to know what you want, um, you have to be prepared to act, right? Like I think of the, the challenges is making sure um, that people feel the impact. A uh, million dollars seems like a lot to most community residents in Flint, but a million dollars doesn't go that far when you're stretching it over seven projects across an entire city. So I think, and that's where communication comes in, I think in a pretty big way, is communicating what's being done if people can't walk out the door and see the immediate impact of that. I think, um, you know, continuing the conversations is vital. Um, to be authentic, you know, which can't be just a one time, we want to hear what you say today, but we really don't care what you're thinking tomorrow. You know, we have to be dedicated to doing this. And I know that we are as a team, um, but it is a big time commitment and it's worth it. I'm going to tell people out there who are considering doing this and at their own foundations, it's definitely worth it, but you just have to be ready for the time commitment um, that, that, it, that it takes to do the job well. Right, and, and I think it's not even the time commitment to do it, but we got a lot of data and a lot of information from this, probably way more than we thought we would get. So it's making sure um, to put time aside after these community conversations and these engagement sessions to know, okay, we actually have to look at all of this strategically and really take the time to, to understand what we heard from residents, you know, because a lot of times, they, they talked about neighborhood differently than we would have talked about neighborhood. You know, they see it as their street across from their house and their immediate everyday, you know, kind of environment. So it's really trying, being able to analyze what you're getting from this. Um, part of the session, you know, really is to talk about why community engagement should not just be a one-time project, that it, it needs to be an ongoing um, initiative. Karma, as a resident, as well as, you know, kind of a, a community advocate, from your perspective, why is this so important for us to not stop here? Wow. Being engaged with the community is necessary in order to continue to move forward because the way things happened before, without community engagement, you're relying on someone else to tell our story. And they may not have all the facts. So coming straight to us, getting it straight from the horse's mouth is always beneficial. And we, I believe uh, the Flint community may be ahead of the game when it comes to community engagement because of what we've dealt with uh, from the water crisis and before the water crisis. People had been tired of the same old, same old. So residents started to speak up and speak out. And so by the time Mott Foundation approached us, they had already been talking. So it was quite natural for them to share more with you because they didn't know when that next time may come. But as long as you keep up with that, community engagement, you'll find that that trust grows. Mm -hmm. And Karma, you mentioned this to Amy and I before as we were kind of getting ready for the session. And so I always like to bring it up if, if you don't happen to, but can you talk a little bit, you, you've mentioned before that you saw kind of a ripple effect that there was some, that the momentum was kind of contagious. Can you talk a little bit about what you meant by that? It was, it was the excitement. It was because people had been out there doing that work themselves with no funding or very little funding. And my foundation is kind of thought of as Flint's grandfather or father. And 
once they say they're going to do something, people tend to believe it. And then other organizations kind of hop on the bandwagon in order to start focusing on whatever it is that Mott Foundation is focusing on. And they are also approaching these residents and community groups asking, what can we do? Can we help do this? And they're coming from outside the county also. So that is, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you, Karma. Well, and we're all here because <laughs> we're communications professionals. So there was a lot of communication, communicating to be done during this process. Um, I don't think I fully realized it when I started um, working with the team on this, but it was so important. So yes, we're going to listen to the residents, but making sure to continue to update the residents was very important because they made it very clear that they didn't want you just to listen and then go away. So we could have been doing things in the background, but maybe they didn't know about it. So what feels like over communication isn't. So that's just a very important part to think about. If you think you're over communicating, you're putting too much out there, you're not. Because residents want to know that you're still working on it, that you haven't forgot about them, that you heard them. And so there's just a lot to be done with that. I think there's probably more we even could have done. Um, but our, our focus on flint.org website was very important. Um, we made sure to keep all of our updates in one place. Um, but we also, as we went throughout this process, we collected anyone's email who wanted to give it to us. Um, and we would put an email blast out to them first. So before we put something on social, before we put a press release out, um, before we put it out to anyone else, we put it back to our residents who have been involved in the process the whole time. So that was important. Um, but it, it was just, I don't think I could have realized how important it would have been in the process. So don't discontinue that while you're listening, make sure to also can continue to talk back with them. Um, if you want to see any of the things that we've done, uh, please feel free to check out focus on flint.org. I just wanted to show you one a uh, quick section. This was kind of our updates page. Um, and you'll see everything from uh, the latest all the way down to the first kind of update. So if, if someone's very new to the process, they can see where it all started and kind of how it went. And, and this website kind of, it, it adjusted as we went. It didn't start off like this. We had more pages. We had, you know, so feel free to see what works best, so, you know, how were residents wanting to digest the updates? How were they wanting to hear from you? We kind of, you know, had to figure it out as we go, but don't underestimate your role in this, even though we're saying, listen to the residents, make sure communications is, is in there, you know, every step of the way as well. And now I think we're going to take some questions. And we have a number of them. All right, so let's get to it. Uh, and folks, you can put your questions in a Q&A box, which is adjacent to the chat. Y'all know this. And then you can also vote for questions. So that's what I'm going to use to guide what we get to. I think we have seven in there right now. First one uh, comes from our friend Susan Kirkpatrick, who asks, was there a particular event, a situation, or some sort of community issue that spurred all this work to begin with? What made y'all start taking this step forward? Amy, I'll start. And if you want to chime in, I would love Amy to chime in because I kind of came in um, halfway through the process. So, but I do know a big part of it was seeing how everyone else was talking about Flint. You know, we had national news and state news all talking about the Flint water crisis and, and what that was like. Um, and we wanted them to have a chance to tell it too. And so Ridgeway kind of was inspired by um, another publication out of Canada, actually. Um, and it really inspired him to say, hey, we can do this in Flint too, and allow residents to, to be able to tell a little bit of their story. Amy, I don't know if you have some more input to that. Yeah, no, I mean, that's basically it. Um, I think the, the, and we had a change in leadership at the foundation and we had a, a, a relatively new president when he got his legs under him really wanted to talk to the the community really wants to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations i mean i think he would do it all himself if he could um obviously he can't and he's using his team to make that happen so it was really 
you know, a, a mission from our leader to make this happen. And it was just very smart of them. So, so sort of a related follow on, were there any, you just mentioned a, a source in Canada, but were there any other organizations that you look to as models or guides? As you're talking about this, it reminds me of the Brooklyn Community Foundation's work, their moonshot that they did sort of similarly where they wanted to go ahead and make sure that the residents were actually guiding the, the giving of funds. Were there any examples that you all looked to or, or folks you spoke to? Yeah, uh, Sarah, do you want me to take that? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so we were lucky. Uh, one of our colleagues, um, uh, Jennifer Acre, was actually a part of a foundation group about doing community engagement, which I believe was led by the Ford Foundation. I could be wrong on that, but I believe so. So she was really pretty intimately involved with that group and their learning and learning from them. So we were able to kind of um, take what the best practices were learned from that group that was super helpful to us and as well as our own community foundation i know that popped up as a question as well and our community foundation in flint also does a lot of community engagement um, and so they were part of our team of advisors to to help us um, figure out the best way to get it done sarah anything to add there Nope, I think she covered most. You got it. Okay, so Jessica, our friend Jessica Scadron has a question. She asks, were residents compensated in any way for their time? Uh, they weren't. Um, you know, we, we went back and forth and it, it was just, they were excited to talk to us more than we thought, to be honest. We did make sure there was a dinner and we always asked the co-host um, dinner or snacks or, you know, whatever it, it might be. But um, we definitely had the conversation and we weren't against that. It just, um, we had some great groups of, of residents that were excited to talk to us, but we did always make sure there was uh, a meal or a snack, um, something to, to make it worth their time to come to us. And um, kind of something fun with that is we always reached out to the co-hosts and said, who would you like? Is there a local uh, a local neighborhood restaurant that you would like to um, support. And so we obviously covered all of that, but um, for these rounds, they weren't compensated, but we're definitely not against, you know, say a farmer's market gift card or things of that matter. Compensation was not necessary. When we're talking about improving our quality of, quality of life, we can wait until that happens for our compensation. So as far as a gift card, I mean, thanks for feeding us, but <laughs> we're looking forward to the improvement. Carmen, that's a question. Maybe we can go a little bit deeper there because there's been some conversations within our field, within the sector about this idea of, is it ethical to ask people to give you their time if you are not compensating them? But your, your immediate kind of answer is no. Talk to me a little bit about that, if you don't mind. Well, I'm not sure about other communities, but here in our community, we've had people out there doing the work themselves in order to try to maintain properties that's owned by the government. They're trying to make sure trash is picked up, up and down the street. They're trying to make sure our neighborhood is well lit. And a lot of people are doing that on their own. So when another group or foundation comes in and say, hey, we would like to help you. Talk to us, let us know what you need. We're gonna start running our mouth. So we're not even, I'm not personally, I won't even ask what is it in this for me? Because I'm thinking what's in it for me is not to have to go out there and cut all of that grass. It's good sense. And I know the folks who are closest to the challenges or, or the opportunities sometimes are the folks you need to be talking to. So it's kind of you all to make the time for everybody. Our friend Mora has a question. She asks, what percent of the foundation's giving is 1 million? Is this in addition to the annual funding from the foundation or is this part of an annual distribution level? And forgive me Mora if I somehow bungled that question. Uh, overall, it's a very small percentage of our giving because we don't just give to Flint or we do international giving at the, at the Charles Stewart Mount Foundation. But it was in addition to our budget for the Flint giving. So we did not take that out of money that we would typically give to Flint. It was in addition to what we typically give to Flint or what was budgeted to give to Flint. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point, Amy, and I was going to make it if you didn't, but yeah, it didn't take away from any of um, the grant making that was already being done in Flint. Um, and there's even some grants that we've done recently that um, 
were right along what residents were telling us they wanted to see happen. And so we make sure to say this is in addition to the 1 million. You know, it didn't take away from the 1 million um, and it didn't take away from our normal grant making. So it was definitely a special initiative um, that we wanted to, to see how residents wanted to see where that money could go. Um, but it didn't take away from things that were already there. And I, I got to say, I think that's important, Sean. It's important because you don't want your current grantees and current programs to feel, feel threatened by the community giving um, instead being welcomed for that because, you know, it, that's easy to happen because your current grantees are your voice typically for what needs to be done in the community to increase that quality of life. And because we were doing something new and different, we really did not want people to feel like, oh, well, we don't think our grantees are telling us the right thing or they're going to lose money based on what the community tells us they want. We really wanted to feel like something added, something in addition to. Right. And since I'm going to take the privilege of a question, because I know we still have about 10 minutes left, so we'll get to many, as many of these as we can. Uh, but the audience here is mostly folks who are doing communications work. What skills did you have to bring in or what things did you have to learn? It's possible you may not have been so good at one thing or another, whether that was building a brand new website or hosting events. These are difficult tasks. They sit inside of communications departments. I know Catherine Thomas is a pro's pro and she comes with that background from the Robert Wood Johnson uh, kind of the coaching tree, right? She was there for many, many years. But what did you, Sarah, you and KT and the rest of the team at Monty were doing the comms work? What did you have to learn? Or what could you lean on that you'd already been working on that complemented some of the things you were called on to do here? Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of stuff that we had to kind of bring in the mix. And some of it was all of a sudden we're like, oh, we need this. And I'll, to be honest, when we're talking about implicit biases and those things that we've learned, it wasn't, nat it wasn't naturally our key thing to be like, okay, we're creating this oh, we need to make sure we have a translated version. So that was kind of, um, you know, if we had specific, you know, because we have our Latinx community center that is a grantee and we work with them on a regular basis, but we might have more, obviously, a Spanish-speaking community outside of that community center. So it was really just making sure when we created one piece of information that we're creating multiple versions of that. So we're reaching more of our community. Um, and we, we built a microsite. So uh, Macy on our team worked with another company to help bring that in. It was very fascinating um, as a communications professional um, that deals with a lot of writing and materials. I had no idea the work and time that it goes into creating that, that new microsite and the voting platform. So that's kind of a bit of advice. Give yourself extra time because if you want to get something up quickly, it may or may not uh, happen. So that was kind of something we had to retrain ourselves. I couldn't personally speak to how long it would take to put something on the new site. So we had to make sure we gave us plenty of times or just kind of dial back our expectations for how quickly because we're ready to move as communications professionals. Let me write this press release. Let me write this email. Let me update this on, you know, this text on the website or share some photos. But there's a lot more moving pieces when you're trying to make sure you're translating everything into Spanish that you are uh, making it available not just online but in person and maybe some flyers and getting it to community centers. So I think it that was the biggest thing for me, I think, was just trying to figure out, do we have a version of this in a way that will reach uh, every part of our community? And we had community members said that, we get a lot of our information from a specific TV station. So we needed to make sure, you know, they're watching it in the morning. So they may not be, you know, reading it. So just hearing how they get their information. And we did ask that question on the survey. So we knew if we wanted to reach the community, how do we do that? So it was just that sort of mindset of making sure you have multiple versions of what you're sharing back. Carmen, I'm going to put you on the spot. How'd they do? How are the communications coming out of our friends from Mott? Oh, they did great. Um, they even shared the information in our community newspaper, Flint, Our Community, Our Voice. It was all over social media. It, we had flyers, uh, information at different locations. They hit it out the park. Oh, good. And can I ask a question? I, I, I'm just having some fun here, but did they speak philanthropy or did they speak English? They spoke English. Oh, they did a lot of talking, uh, a lot of listening. They did a lot of listening. And I'm not sure 
who helped him out <laughs> on that language part because I was expecting it to be a little difficult, but it wasn't. We sometimes use the $75 words. I can't imagine KT would let that happen on, in her shop, but it, it does happen. And we're all a little guilty of it. We love us some journey. You, you make a good point. Um, when we had the publication, a lot of work went into making sure um, we were paying attention to the literacy rates in our community. And we still, we still were trying to balance that line of, um, is this accessible to a lot of people without feeling like we're talking down to them? Right, so I mean that is important as communicators that you're authentic in what you're saying in a way that can reach more people. But you know we're still we still don't know if we reach that with the publication. You know maybe we'll do less words, more graphics. But you want to make sure you're reaching the community, paying attention to literacy rates and bigger words that you might be using that you don't think anything of. So it's important to bring community members in for that as well and read what you're putting out there to make sure it, it is accessible. Yeah. Is I think the biggest problem was uh, by the focus on Flint coming through the mail, some people even admit it, they just kind of toss it to the side as those junk mail. So that was one of the issues that I noticed and but once we actually explained what it was, they went back and grabbed it. A couple more questions from our friends. Allison asks, did you feel it was important for you to signal that your foundation was permanently changed by your listening? So I presume this was not the first time that, that Mott has gone out to the community to do some listening. You're doing a lot of work in the community there, but, but how did, were you changed or how's the organization been transformed? How's Ridgeway perhaps been transformed by this? I mean, I think the proof is in the pudding, Sean. I mean, really, it's not about what happened yesterday, but it's about what happens tomorrow, right? I mean, I think we'll know, we feel changed, certainly, and I feel like our we are dedicated to this changed approach in, in some of our grant making, but um, we have to make that happen. And, and I think the community, why we've worked so hard to build that trust and that understanding with them, we have to, to continue to do this. I think um, Ridgeway and, the, and our entire team have a better understanding of what's really important to the community residents in Flint. Um, and we, we have a better sense of the importance of having that one-on-one -on -one relationship and are really dedicated to continuing to see that happen. Yeah, I, I would agree with Amy, but I mean, we still have a lot of work to do. I mean, you saw in one of the slides, we reached 400 people. Um, so to say our foundation has changed is probably a little premature, but I definitely, it changes our mindset, I think, and how we want to uh, approach it. And I think it just reminds us how important it is to listen. So to say we're a changed foundation is probably a little too far, but I know we're working toward that to know why this type of engagement is so important. And it just kind of changes how we think about, you know, our grant making and, and communications. So this won't surprise you to hear some of our friends are already asking, so you did this, can I borrow some? And so Lisa has a question just like that. She's up in Alaska. She asks, could we see the form for input used at the community conversations in the survey? I think, Sarah, you had mentioned you might do the vote for specific projects differently. What would you change? And if it's easier to answer that offline, maybe the question could be, can Lisa shoot, shoot you an email or, or give you a phone call or tweet at you or any number of different things uh, mm -hmm. in order to, to get some of those answers? Are you open to sharing what you're learning? Yes, absolutely. Feel free to um, shoot me an email. Okay. So Lisa, if you don't mind, we'll make sure we put you in touch with Sharon. We'll take responsibility for that. Um, Susan asks, and Amy, I think this is a question for you. How did you engage your board to gain their support for this initiative? How did that happen? I don't think we needed to convince them. <laughs> I do think that is, but um, we, we kept them up to date on what we were planning. And it was great actually, when we were working on our publication before we sent it out, um, we did show them a draft and they were very engaged. They were excited about what we were doing. They had some very thoughtful um, feedback. I think that's the benefit and the importance of having an engaged board is they did take time to read it and look through it and give us their feedback. And it did help us rethink some things before we mailed out the final draft. So Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we had to convince them, but it was more or less um, they were working alongside us because they were engaged in the process. 
I mean, I, we have a really good set of leaders at the Charles Sturmont Foundation. We really do. And they were excited about this work. And they also knew the potential pitfalls of doing this work. So they were dedicated as we were to making sure that we did it right. And that we were actually going to listen and react to what we heard. Um, and I think that was the most important thing to them as well. And they conveyed that to us and their trust in us to, to do that. Um, so as Sarah said, we did not have to convince them. Um, but you know, they were, they were a little concerned as we were that we get it done, that we do it right that we be authentic and that we do something with what we've heard. So maybe a quick follow on is our question from our friend, Amy Plotch, who asks, will this change the way that you all operate on the program side and on the comm side, looking into the future? Like, is this going to be a place that you'll look to as a place of learning and a place of growth? I can speak obviously from the communication side and yes, absolutely. It, not that we weren't authentic before, but I think it, really just teaches us to think about not just what we're saying, but how we're saying it. So as Karma mentioned before, so we're not that ivory tower in downtown Flint, right? Like that we're, we're trying to really understand the residents and where they're coming from. And we're talking to them like they're important and this is their community too and they're involved. It's, it's not us making decisions and letting them know about it. It's, it's us kind of taking them um, along the process with us. So from a communication standpoint, it taught me a lot of things about creating communication pieces that are very inclusive. Yeah, no, I think, that, I think that's right. I think also from a program side, um, realize how valuable those relationships really are. Um, to be on the ground, to be open so that people see us on the street. And if they're not seeing us, they feel free to call us. And, you know, we've had community residents since then just call and say, hey, can you meet me for lunch? I want to talk to you about something that's happening in my neighborhood, where typically we wouldn't have those types of relationships. So it definitely has changed us. Um, and I'm very hopeful that we're going to continue to build those relationships and sustain them in the Flint community and, and reach more people in um, 2021, hopefully when we can get back on the ground and we're not doing so much virtually. <laughs> and Karma, what about you? What did you take away from this whole experience or are you taking away? I realize it's not quite done yet. Well, with me, I'm, uh, I may be a little different, but I see it as it's changed the community already. And we're looking forward to the next time because the next time you're definitely going to have more people speaking up and sharing. And I like the fact that I could walk through downtown, see somebody from my foundation, throw my hand up and they're waving back. So we're all, we're really all in this together now. It is amazing what a little bit of trust and kindness can do, right? And with that, maybe I should say thank you. We are now over time and I wanna be respectful. I know other people have things they gotta to get to and you all, Amy and Sarah and Carmen have been incredibly generous and kind with your time to share what you've been learning. It's a wonderful story. We're incredibly grateful. And if you don't mind, on behalf of everybody who's able to be with us, thank you. We will have a recording available up online fairly soon so you can share it out. And I suspect, uh, are you all open to it? Carmen, would include you here. Do you all mind if people reach out and, and, and ask a few questions if they have them? No, not at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nodding. Okay, well, I'll take that as a yes. Uh, thank you very, very much. I have a couple quick things just to remind you. If you were late to join us, Tristan, if you'll throw up the slides real quickly, just want to remind everybody, we will be back next week. Jesse Salazar will be in conversation with Evan Wolfson. It is not hyperbole to say that he changed America. Evan was the person who was principally responsible for reshaping, using communications research, reshaping the way that the fight or the, the conversation or the movement towards marriage equality occurred. Um, deep sort of interesting ways of pursuing all that research, which he's going to talk about with Jesse Salazar. That's next Thursday. So just a little bit over a week from today. And then a little bit later on, you'll see it there. Dr. Clarence B. Jones, who helped to write the dream speech with Martin Luther King and Carmen. If you'd like to join us for this, you are more than welcome. Uh, Dr. Clarence B. Jones, who helped to write the dream speech with Martin Luther King is going to reflect on what we've all been learning across the span of this year, which has been a difficult year for so many different reasons. Uh, but we're going to talk about that as well as the vote and what's up ahead and how people can exercise their voice and use their power. So that's happened with Jenny Oldham leading that conversation, our friend from Nashville. And that's uh, just about two weeks from now. That's October the 20th. And still more to come. Really exciting stuff uh, ahead between now and December. Hope you all are well. Stay well. We'll see you all soon. And uh, thanks very much for making the time, all of you, particularly Amy, Sarah, and Karma, and Marva as well. Thank you, everybody. Bye.